الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على رسوله الأمين وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين وصحابته أجمعين ومن صار على نهجهم إلى يوم الدين أما بعد فالسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته uh, This afternoon we want to take a look at a wonderful and a beautiful hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and as we say with all of these ahadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that they are beautiful words and frankly speaking us simply reading them and maybe sending them to each other in emails and so on and so forth is not going to benefit until such time that we can actually internalize them, so we ponder over them, and then actualize them. We put them into action. So this is my hope, always, that when we look at these ahadith of the Prophet Wasallam, we're looking to see how it is that we can apply them in our lives. And indeed, this particular hadith that we're going to be looking at this afternoon is one of those ahadith that if we truly understand it and we truly put it into action we apply it in our lives then I am absolutely certain that our lives will change completely this hadith is an authentic one and it is one narrated by Abdullah ibn Abbas anhu warda. in it he tells us that he was riding behind the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam meaning that he was sitting behind him on one and the same riding animal and this of course is from the humbleness of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam although he was who he was that is the messenger of Allah Sallallahu Rabbi Wasallamuhu Alaihi and he's the best of creation he was the head of state except that he had time for everyone for everyone and you have all these examples in the seerah of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam where perhaps as he was walking an elderly woman stopped him and she had some sort of a request and so he listened to her and he fulfilled whatever she she had asked for perhaps as he was walking sallallahu alayhi wasallam through uh, one of the uh, side streets if you will of al Madina, uh, a young girl stopped him and grabbed a hold of his hand and took him for a walk through all the other gullies and he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam allowed her to take him through salawatu rabbi wa salamuhu alayhi so he had time for everyone and he was humble it's not that because he was the messenger of Allah and the head of state he had to have his own riding animal and he wouldn't allow anyone to share so Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma was sitting behind him and he was still very young so the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam addresses him saying Ya Ghulam, O oh young man Inni wa'allimuka kalimat I'm going to teach you some words. In other words, here are some words of advice. Listen to them carefully and act upon them. And he continues, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says, Ihfadillaha Yahfavk. Be mindful of Allah and Allah will protect you. Ihfadillaha tajidhu tujahak. Be mindful of Allah and you will always find him before you, in front of you. تعرف على الله في الرخاء يعرفك في الشدة. Become acquainted with Allah during times of ease, and Allah will be well acquainted with you during times of difficulty. إذا سألت فاسأل الله. When you ask, ask of Allah. وإذا استعنت فاستعن بالله. And when you seek assistance, when you want aid. Then seek aid and assistance from Allah. وَعْلَمْ أَنَّ الْأُمَّةَ لَوْ اجْتَمَعَتْ عَلَىٰ أَنْ يَنْفَعُوكَ بِشَيْءٍ لَنْ يَنْفَعُوكَ إِلَّا بِشَيْءٍ قَدْ كَتَبَهُ اللَّهُ لَكْ And be aware of this. That if everyone were to unite and agree that they were going to bring some good to you, they were going to benefit you in some way, they would never be able to accomplish this goal of theirs unless it was already something that Allah had decreed for you. 
wa anna al-ummata law ijtama'u ala an yadhurruka bi shay'in lan yadhurruka illa bi shay'in qad katabahu Allahu 'alayk and similarly if they had all agreed that they were going to harm you in some way shape or form then they would never be able to accomplish this goal of theirs unless it is already something which Allah has written against you rufi'at al-aqlam wa jaffat as-suhuf so the pens have been lifted and the pages have dried and there are other narrations of this hadith and in them we find for example that the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said وَاعْلَمْ أَنَّمَا أَصَابَكَ لَمْ يَكُنْ لِيُخْطِئَكَ وَأَنَّمَا أَخْطَأَكَ لَمْ يَكُنْ لِيُصِيبَكَ And be aware that anything that has reached you or has happened to you, then it was never meant to pass you by. And anything that passed you by, it was never meant to reach you. And he said, صلى الله عليه وسلم, وَاعْلَمْ أَنَّ الْفَرَجَ مَعَ الْكَرْبِ And he says that you should be aware that relief comes with affliction. So you'll be afflicted and then the relief will come. And victory will come with patience. And difficulty will come with ease. So although there's going to be difficulty but it will be followed up with ease. Now I want to go back and take a look at this particular hadith in a little bit more detail. In the hope that inshallah ta'ala we will we will benefit by applying it in our lives and living by this particular by this particular hadith ihfaz billah yahfazuk be mindful of allah what does that part of the hadith actually mean be mindful of allah means that we should be or we should safeguard our duties we should safeguard those boundaries and those limits set by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In other words, it is close to saying that we should have a taqwa. Huh? And we talked about a taqwa before, uh, that, that is to fear Allah or to be conscious of Allah such that we fulfill our obligations and abstain from the prohibitions so that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will protect us from any sort of punishment. So, ihfaz Allah yahfazk. This is why many of the scholars say, that if you were to advise someone, if you were asked by someone, you know, you're put on the spot, give me some advice. The best advice you can give someone is, Ihfadillah. Be mindful of Allah. A very profound piece of advice. A couple words, but they speak volumes. Ihfadillah yahfadk. So be mindful of Allah. Do that which you must do for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Abstain from those things which will make Allah angry. Abstain from those things which you know that Allah is displeased with. And what will be the result? Then Allah will protect you. Protect you how? Allah will protect you in every way. Whether it be physically, in terms of, of your physical well-being. Whether it be in your wealth. Whether it be in your family. And even with respect to your religion. Allah will assist you and protect you. Remember that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran وَالَّذِينَ اهْتَدَوْ زَادَهُمْ زَادَهُمْ هُدًا وَآتَاهُمْ تَقْوَاهُمْ So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran that those who are guided so if we do what we're supposed to do then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will increase us in guidance. Also, we learn from the sunnah of the Prophet wasallam the opposite of that. In other words, those who choose to go astray. Those who choose to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then unless they repent and they turn back to Allah azza wa jal, they will go further and further into misguidance. That hadith is a famous one in which we are told that when an individual commits a sin, transgresses against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then there is a black dot which is placed on his or her heart. And if the person were to repent, were to sincerely return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then it is wiped away. But otherwise, 
it will remain. And then when the person commits another sin, another dot will be placed and so on and so forth until the heart will be covered in these black dots and no good will reach it. وَالْعِيَادَ billah. So, اِحْفَظِ اللَّهَ يَحْفَظُكَ The most important thing that we can be protected in by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is of course our faith. But the protection of Allah will come in many other forms as well. And we will look in just a few moments at examples of how Allah Azza wa Jal protected so many of His uh, righteous slaves in the past. And of course, it can be done for us as well. إِحْفَظِ اللَّهَ تَجِدْهُ تُجَاهَكْ Be mindful of Allah and you will always find Him before you. That is, you see, we as human beings, it is natural. And we know that it is the way of Allah in His creation that we are not independent in every way. We are very much dependent on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We need Him. There is no one who can say they can do without Allah's help. No. There are going to be times when you will realize that all doors are closed but the door of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so we constantly need to be reminded of this. And so what you will find is that the more an individual is obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the more they will find that Allah is there for them in their time and their hour of need. تَعَرَّفْ عَلَى اللَّهِ فِي الرَّخَاءِ يَعْرِفْكَ فِي الشِدَّةِ Be well acquainted with Allah during times of ease, when things are going well. And then during times of hardship, when you are surrounded by difficulties, then you will see how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is familiar with you. And the hadith continues. As I said, we will look at it in a little bit more detail. Now, let's go back to this first portion. Be mindful of Allah and He shall protect you. You know, these words were said by Ya'qub alayhi salam. If you look to the Quran, then you will find in Surah Yusuf when Yusuf alayhi salam was taken away from his father Ya'qub alayhi salam and Ya'qub alayhi salam remembered that his son was out there and he could be eaten up by the wild animals when he remembered that you know his own flesh and blood had been taken away from him as though his heart had been torn out he said these words, فَاللَّهُ خَيْرٌ حَافِظًا وَهُوَ أَرْحَمُ الرَّاحِمِينَ That Allah is the best guardian, the best protector, and He is the most merciful of the merciful. فَاللَّهُ خَيْرٌ حَافِظًا وَهُوَ أَرْحَمُ الرَّاحِمِينَ Remember that verse from the Qur'an, that Allah is the best of guardians, the best of protectors. Ayah 64 of Surah Yusuf. And recall some of these incidents and these stories that I'm about to relate to you. Not for entertainment purposes, but for the sake of taking lesson from them. I said a, a while ago that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will protect us even in our bodies. So many scholars, I mean, they are old, subhanAllah. They may be 80, 90 years old. And you find that their memory is still sharp. You ask them a question. And they're able to rattle off ayat from the Qur'an, a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. They will give you the opinions of scholars of the past and you'll be shocked at how this person, being as old as they are, still have such a sharp memory. So many of them were asked, how come you're still able to, uh, to be so sharp? You still remember all of these things. And their response used to be that when we were young, when we were young, we safeguarded these limbs of ours. And now that we have become old, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has preserved them for us. Al Imam ibn Kathir, rahimahullah ta'ala, mentions uh, the story of Abu Tib al Tabari, a man in his 70s who happened to be on a ship with some other people. And amongst them, there were some youth. And as this ship 
came close to a shore but did not dock yet Abu Tayyib al-Tabari wanted to get off and get to the shore and so did the youth that were with him so what he did was he jumped off and he was able to reach the shore whereas the youth were not able to do so when they questioned him and they asked him they said you're an old man how is it that you had the strength and the ability to, to do so and we couldn't do it and his response was that I mentioned to you earlier and that is he said to them that when I was young I protected these limbs of mine that is he was obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he did not misuse these limbs in disobeying Allah Azza wa Jal. And so he says, Allah has preserved them for me. He gave me the strength right up until right up until this age. Fallahu khayrun hafiza wa huwa arhamur rahimin. We also find these incidents mentioned by the by the scholars and, and and these are found in many different books not in just one book but we have you know a, a tarajim and so on and so forth where the biographies are written uh, so you find uh, as an example ibn rajab rahimahullah ta'ala was relating an amazing story and it happens to be about this righteous man and scholar by the name of malik ibn dinar he talks about how he was sleeping one day we're talking about now the protection of Allah Azza wa Jal and it comes in so many different ways, shapes and forms he's talking about this day when he entered a garden and he fell asleep he says then when I awakened I was shocked to find a snake a snake which had taken a flower into its mouth and with that flower it was chasing away the flies and the mosquitoes in other words, preventing them from landing on me and preventing them from harming me. Who is it other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who caused this karama, this sort of miracle to happen for one of his close friends, that is, one of his awliya. And of course, nobody should think, oh, how come you know, we're talking about karamat and you know, kind of types of miracles that happen to people? No. Ahlu sunnati wal jama'a believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does allow some of these types of miracles to happen to those who are righteous and those who are pious. فَاللَّهُ خَيْرٌ حَافِظًا وَهُوَ أَرْحَمُ الرَّاحِمِينَ How does Allah Azza wa Jal protect us? In so many ways. Look to Sahih al-Bukhari at the incident of the two men from Bani Israel. They didn't even really know each other. But the one needed to borrow money. So he comes to this other Israeli man and he asks him to lend him a thousand dinars. So the man says to him, alright, but who is your kafil? Who's your guarantor? Uh, fair enough question. The man says, I have no one but Allah. So the other one says, Raditu Billah. I am pleased with Allah being your guarantor. So then he says, okay, let's write this agreement between us that I'm lending you a thousand dinars and they are due on such and such a date. So he starts writing and then, of course, when you write these types of agreements, there's a place where you need to write the name of a witness. And he says, who is your witness? Man yashhadu lak. And the man thinks and he says, well, I really have no one but Allah. Allah will be my witness. Again, this man, placing his trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, says, All right, I accept that Allah will be Allah will be your witness. They sign the paper and he hands over the thousand dinars. And this Israeli leaves his companion and goes off to wherever he's going to go. The one who lent the money doesn't know where he's going. All he knows is he gave him a thousand dinars as a loan. And the man placed Allah as a witness. And the man's guarantor is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That was sufficient for him. So the man goes off with a thousand dinars. And when the time comes when he has to repay the debt. 
Did he ignore it? Thinking that, listen, you know, the guy's got nothing on me. He doesn't even know where I am. So forget about it? No, he was very concerned. He was mindful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He made this promise in the name of Allah azza wa jal. So he was going to repay. He was going to repay his loan. And he comes with a thousand dinars to the shore because he needed to catch a boat in order to get to the place where the man is that, that lent him the money. But the waters were choppy. The waves were high and he could find no ships. So he went back home and came back later. But it was still quite stormy out and he could not find himself a ship. And he's thinking, but I have to get there. This man on the other side was waiting for him. How am I going to get the money to him? So finally he said, that's it. I placed Allah as my guarantor. I placed Allah as my witness. He turns to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he says, Ya Allah, allow this debt of mine to be repaid. Then the man gets an idea. He gets a, a log, a piece of wood. And he carves it out. And he writes a note. And he places it in, in that log with the 1,000 dinars and he covers it up and in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he throws it into the sea. And the man is waiting on the other side. The one whom he lent the money to is supposed to come and return it to him. And he waits and he waits and he waits. But nobody shows up. Finally he says to himself, oh there's a piece of wood. The least I can get out of taking the trouble to come here is that I take back some firewood for my family. So he takes that log from the sea and he heads home. And, you know, of course he must have been disappointed. But nonetheless, that is fine. And he starts to chop the wood. And what does he find inside? He finds the note and he finds the thousand dinars that the other individual had sent to him. فَاللَّهُ خَيْرٌ حَافِظًا these are not made up stories. This is a hadith found in Sahih al-Bukhari. This happened to these two men in Bani Israel. Then we have the incident with Silat ibn Ashyam and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protected him. So Ibn Kathir rahimahullah and Abu Nu'im, both of them relate uh, this incident of Silat ibn Ashyam who fought alongside Qutayba ibn Muslim in this battle in Khurasan which is close to uh, Kabul, Afghanistan. Silat ibn Ashyam, rahimahullah ta'ala, was that type of man who after Salat al-Isha until Salat al-Fajr would spend his time in the worship of Allah Azza wa Jal. He would stand in prayer and carry out other acts of worship and he was known for crying you know, out of fear of Allah Tabaraka wa ta'ala. Sirat ibn Ashyam or Qutayba ibn Muslim used to be so happy and so pleased that he had somebody like Sirat ibn Ashyam in his army. And he used to say, Alhamdulillah alladhi ja'ala fi jayshi mithlaka ya sila. He says, I thank and I praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for placing people like you in my army. Sirat ibn Ashyam, and here I, I, I want, I mean, in some of these incidents that we find from the uh, from our pious predecessors, we may think that there's some exaggeration. But really it goes to show of how much they appreciated who Allah Jalla wa'ala was. Sayyidat ibn Ashyam at night okay, think about you and me today and think about this man. You and I if we want to go out Usually this is the time we will bear, wear the best of our clothing. Right? Because you have to look good in front of everybody. There's nothing wrong with that by the way. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased when we dress well, when we smell good. Allah azza wa is pleased with that. Okay? But did we ever think? You see what happens to us is when we're going out to meet people we want to you know, dress to kill. But if we're going to worship before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we'll put on any old clothing that we may have. Correct or not? Allah Azza wa Jalla says in the Quran, Ya Bani Adama, Khudu Zinatakum in the Kulli Masjid. O children of Adam, 
adorn yourselves when you go to the masjid, when you go to your prayers. But you go to the masjid and you go to a wedding party. At the wedding party, the people are dressed to kill. You go to the masjid, they look like they just crawled out of bed and they're there in their pajamas. Not ironed, nothing. Think about it. When you go to the masjid, dress well. When you're standing before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, dress well. Sayyidat ibn Ashyam used to wear a cloak worth a thousand dinars and he used to wear the best of perfume when he would stand in prayer before Allah Azza wa Jal at night. In the daytime, he didn't care how he looked. Although, as I said, the sunnah is that yes, you look good even when you meet the people. Alright? But he had more concern of how he looks before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He would take that beautiful cloak off in the daytime and put it on only at night when he was standing in prayer. Tayyib, ala kulli hal. So he was out with the army at one time, and after they all went to sleep, and this was the way of so many of them. Look at the, uh, you know, the stories and the sunnah and so on and so forth. You will find that this is what, what the case was with so many of them. They would be in a group traveling and so on and so forth. And everybody would go to sleep. And this person would also pretend that he was sleeping. And when he was sure that everybody was asleep, he would sneak out and stand in prayer before Allah Azza wa Jal. Because they didn't do it to show others. They did it for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what he did was when everybody was sleeping, he snuck out and he went into the forest. Okay, so he could stand there and pray before Allah Azza wa Jal. And as we said, his habit was that he would shed tears standing before Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala. Again, this was not, uh, you know, some trip that they went on, camp, a camping trip or a vacation that they were on. This was during a battle. And he was in the front lines. But he finds time at night to stand before Allah wa ta'ala. And as I said, they were close to uh, Kabul. So there he is standing before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and all of a sudden a lion, the king of the jungle, starts to circle him. Now the lion of course, uh, it got its name, the king of the jungle. Alright, uh, a fierce animal. The Arabs used to be so scared of it, if they knew that a lion was you know, somewhere to be found down this route, they would make sure they, they take another route. After he said his salam from, from his salah, he was distracted by that particular lion. So he turned to that lion and he addressed it. And he said to the lion, if you had been ordered to come and devour me, to eat me up, then get it over with quickly. But if Allah has not ordered you to come and kill me, then just get away and leave me between me and Allah. He relates that after he said this, the lion toned down. It stopped roaring, it put its tail down, it humbled itself and walked away. فَاللَّهُ خَيْرٌ حَافِظًا وَهُوَ أَرْحَمُ الرَّاحِمِينَ I'm not saying that you'll necessarily come across these lions and all of that kind of stuff, but you know, you might be on a trip. You might face some sort of, of a danger. Allah forbid, you may be on an aircraft and there may be problems with the aircraft. Think of the multitude of possibilities, what could possibly go wrong. And perhaps because of one or some of your good deeds that you have done, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will protect you. Look, do you not find in the sunnah the story of those three men who were trapped in a cave, that huge boulder that covered them up? Through what did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save them? What is it that they turned to Allah azza wa jalla with? Did they just turn to Allah and say, Ya Allah, you know, open up the mouth of this cave? Move that rock away. Every one of them turned to Allah Azza wa Jal, remembering a good deed that they had done. True or not? So, these good deeds, they will pay off ultimately. There is no, there is no doubt about that whatsoever. Tayyip. All of this, you know, humbling ourselves, it is important. And we take lessons from, you know, the, the best from amongst the righteous before us. You remember Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu arda 
when he came to uh, Beit al-Maqdis al uh, al Aqsa when they took it uh, when they were able to uh, when they were able to recapture it how is it that he came when he happened to be with one of his uh, when, when he was with one of his servants you would think that Umar radiallahu an is accompanied by his servant so Umar will be riding the animal and the servant will be will be walking but Umar radiallahu an says to his servant Let's take turns. I'll ride for a while, and you walk, and then you will ride for a while, and I will walk. So the servant says to him, Ya Amir al Mu'minin, O leader of the believers, how can it be? And what will happen when we, when we reach our destination, and all of the you know, cream of the crop come out to meet us? All the leaders there will come out to meet us. How is it going to look that I am riding and you are walking? If it so happens that that's how the turn will be at the time. Umar radiallahu an became upset with him. And he said, this is not something that you should be, uh, that you should be worried about at all. So they continue this way. And of course, when they were approaching, then all of these, uh, you know, big names, if you will, Amr ibn al-As and so forth, they all came out and they saw that Umar radiallahu anhu was the one walking and his servant was the one who was riding. And their response was, Akhjaltana ya Amir al Mu'minin. That, O leader of the believers, you have put us to shame. Ataqudu al Jamal. Is it really befitting of you to be leading the camel? In other words, you're not riding, you're the one leading it. And this is where the beautiful words of Umar radiallahu anhu Allah, were uttered when he says, Ya Amr, he's, ref- he's now talking to Amr ibn al-As, he says, Ya Amr, نَحْنُ قَوْمٌ أَعَزَّنَ اللَّهُ بِالْإِسْلَامِ فَمَهْمَ بْتَغَيْنَ الْعِزَّةَ فِي غَيْرِهِ أَذَلَّنَ اللَّهُ He says to him, O oh, Amr, we are a people whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala honored and He gave us glory through Islam. So as long as we look for glory outside of Islam, in other than Islam, then Allah will continue to humiliate us. Muhammad ibn Wasir, the next example. Qutiba ibn Muslim again, was about to conquer uh, Khurasan, Kabul, that area. And as he was about to approach, and they were, they were surrounding the city, you know, the swords were drawn. Subhanallah, then he asked the people, look to see where Muhammad ibn Wasir is. Muhammad ibn Wasir was known as well for his piety. They went looking for him, and what they found that, uh, was that he had prayed Salat al-Duha. Salat al-Duha, by the way, just as a reminder, is a sunnah of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam that is offered in the late part of the morning. So, before Salat al-Zuhr, it's a voluntary prayer. It can be offered any time after the sun has risen by, say, approximately 20 minutes or so. So, after sunrise, about 20 minutes onwards, you may start offering voluntary prayers. One of them is Salat al-Duha. And it can be offered right up until before the time of Salat al-Zuhr. And the preferred time is to delay it and not to pray it earlier. Okay, whether it be two or four or six or eight raka'ah, as you wish. Nonetheless, it is a salah that we should not, we should not abandon. At least, if we don't pray it regularly every day, we should try to offer it as many times as we can during, during the week. Anyway, so he prays salat al-duha. And again, I'm amazed. This is during a battle. This is not why he's at home. And so, this is during a battle. And he offers salat al-duha. And he places... You know, his, uh, his sword or his spear on the ground and he's leaning against it and he is turning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with dua, supplication. Ya hayu ya qayyum. Ya hay ya qayyum. And as some of them said, perhaps that is the greatest name of Allah. That name by which when he is called upon, then he is sure to answer your prayer. Ya hayu ya qayyum. Said, Ya Dal Jalali Wal Ikram. Again, he is 
calling upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by his beautiful names and attributes. Nasraka alladhi wa'attana. In other words, we ask you for that victory which you have, which you have promised us. They went back to Qutaybah ibn Muslim and they told him what it is that they saw. And that is when he cried and he said to them, I swear by Allah, besides whom there is no other deity, there is no true God. Just a finger of Muhammad ibn Wasir is more beloved to me. It is more valuable to me than a hundred drawn swords and a hundred of, 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 of uh, from a uh, hundred of the youth, huh? because he realized that it is these pious individuals who are close to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala who would be the means of victory for them. فَاللَّهُ خَيْرٌ حَافِظَ وَهُوَ أَرْحَمُ الرَّاحِمِينَ So yes, the Muslims were victorious. Why? Because of the help of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, and that came due to this piety that was found amongst many of them who were in that particular army. Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu anhu warda. Remember when he was also up against the Romans. Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu an assumed that the Romans were small in number compared to his army. Because he had about 32,000 soldiers with him. So he figured the Romans uh, you know, were, were when, relatively speaking, not, not very large in number. Not realizing that, yes, his army consisted of 32,000 uh, soldiers, but the Roman army had 280,000 soldiers. So what happened? When daytime came, and they saw the battalions and squadrons from the Romans filling up the space before them. Many of those who were with Khalid radiallahu an became scared. But Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu anhu arda, and we know so much about him from the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he wasn't afraid. He realized, فَاللَّهُ خَيْرٌ حَافِظًا وَهُوَ أَرْحَمُ الرَّاحِمِينَ Allah is the best of protectors. And he had a lot going for him. He was, alhamdulillah, always amongst those who was mindful of Allah Azza wa Jal. Kept his duty to Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala. So rather than becoming scared and so on and so forth, he kept his trust in Allah. Then he decided to send a short note. A short note to one of the tribal leaders. Riyadh ibn Ghanam. He sent him a short note. He didn't have time to dictate anything long. But he sent him a very short note. In it he said, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Beginning uh, with the name of Allah, the most merciful, the most compassionate. Min Khalid ibn al Walid, from Khalid ibn al Walid, ila Riyadh ibn Ghanam. To Riyadh ibn Ghanam. Iyaka urid wa salam. I want you salam. That was the note. As soon as the note reached Riyadh ibn Ghanam, and of course now uh, Khalid ibn Walid realized the situation so he had to you know, change his plans. They were not going to engage the enemy until he had you know, a, few more, uh, a few more soldiers with him. When Riyadh ibn Ghanam received the note, of course he realized that it is extremely important. He wept, but immediately he got the people together. I mean, he was one of the tribal leaders. So he got together you know, some soldiers and within a relatively short period of time, they were able to meet Khalid ibn al-Walid and his army. And by the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, three days didn't pass except that Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu anhu arda along with his army was able to conquer huh, the 280,000 strong Roman army. There were 32,000 to begin with, how many more came? <laughs> Another 100,000 did not come. The rest who came were also relatively small in number. Uqba ibn Nafir. This is another one of the righteous and pious, uh, and pious from amongst the, you know, the, the Muslim leaders. And he is the one who traveled to North Africa in order to spread the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when he got to North Africa and they were entering 
they were entering the, uh, the forests. And of course, these forests contain wild animals. Again, he put his trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he addressed the animals. He actually spoke to the animals. He stood in a high place and he called out to the animals and he said to them, نَحْنُ أَصْحَابُ مُحَمَّدٍ عَلَيْهِ الصَّلَاةُ وَالسَّلَامُ We are the companions of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and we have come to conquer these lands with La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah So, go back into your homes and the report states that yes these animals responded to Uqbah ibn Nafi' when he, when he addressed them Look to the prophets of Allah If you look to the Quran you will find how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala aided and assisted his prophets as well. Why? Because they were mindful of Allah. They kept their duty to Allah azza wa jal. So in their hour of need, Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala was there for them. Ihfadillaha yahfadk. Ibrahim alayhi salam. What happened when they realized that it is Ibrahim alayhi salam that destroyed their so-called God? They were furious. Consensus was that they should kill Ibrahim alayhi salam. And the decision was made that they would ignite this fire. An intense fire, so intense that they could not even go near it. So if they couldn't come near the fire, how were they going to place Ibrahim alayhi salam in that fire? They decided to use a catapult, like a huge slingshot. They tossed Ibrahim alayhi salam and as he was flipping through the air Allah azza wa jal sent to him Jibreel alayhi salam Jibreel alayhi salam with the tip of his wing could have put that fire out not a problem so he and of course Ibrahim alayhi salam is well, well aware of this Ibrahim alayhi salam is met by Jibreel as he is flipping through the air and Jibreel says to him Ya Ibrahim do you have any need? is there anything I can do for you? and the response of Ibrahim alayhi salam was as for you in other words as for having any need from you needing any assistance from you then no but as for Allah فَحَسْبُنَ اللَّهُ وَنِعْمَ الْوَكِيلِ حَسْبُنَ اللَّهُ وَنِعْمَ الْوَكِيلِ That Allah is sufficient for me and He is the best disposer of affairs. As we find in the Sunnah, in Sahih al-Bukhari, from the Hadith of Ibn Abbas as well, He says, حَسْبُنَ اللَّهُ وَنِعْمَ الْوَكِيلِ These words, Allah is sufficient for me and he is the best disposer of affairs. These are words that were said by Ibrahim alayhi salam when he was thrown in the fire. And these are the words that were said by Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when, the peop when it was said to him and when it was said to his companions, إِنَّ النَّاسَ قَدْ جَمَعُوا لَكُمْ فَخْشَوْهُمْ That indeed the people have gathered against you. So fear them. فَزَادَهُمْ imana. But Rather than it instilling fear in them, it increased them in faith. وَقَالُوا حَسْبُنَ اللَّهُ وَنِعْمَ الْوَكِيلِ The Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam and his companions all said, حَسْبُنَ اللَّهُ وَنِعْمَ الْوَكِيلِ Allah is sufficient for us and He is the best disposer of affairs. Musa alayhi salam, remember when he had to now go and meet with Fir'aun, that tyrant. Subhanallah, don't think that he went and he didn't fear. قَالَ رَبَّنَا إِنَّنَا نَخَافُ أَنْ يَفْرُطَ عَلَيْنَا أَوْ أَنْ يَطْغَى Musa alayhi salam with his brother Harun alayhi salam when they had to go and meet with Fir'aun they acknowledged, they said to Allah azza wa jalla that we, we do fear. Maybe he'll, he'll do something. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Console them. Qala la takhafa. Allah Azza wa told them, Do not be afraid. Innani ma'akuma asma'u wa ara. I am with you. Huh? Listening. Seeing. He had to face the magicians. 
I mean, all of them were throwing their, you know, uh, their, 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 their canes, their sticks, and they turned, or as it appeared, it turned in, they, they turned into, into snakes. Of course, this also brought some fear to the heart of Musa, alayhi salam. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قُلْنَا لَا تَخَفْ إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ الْأَعْلَى Don't be afraid. Because you do have the upper hand. If Allah Azza wa is with you, then there is nothing to worry about. And you know the rest of the story and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala caused Musa alayhi salam to be victorious. Even later on, with that same cane, he was, at, he was told by Allah Azza wa Jal to, uh, to strike the sea. And finally, Himself and his followers were saved, and Fir'aun and his followers were drowned in the sea. فَاللَّهُ خَيْرٌ حَافِظًا وَهُوَ أَرْحَمُ الرَّاحِمِينَ Looking at the prophets, Yunus ibn Matta. You know, he was ordered by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to invite his people, right, to Islam, to the way of Allah azza wa jal. And when they didn't listen, he left. But he left without the permission of Allah azza wa jal. So this is something that Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala was displeased with and he boarded a ship and when he boarded the ship and they were in the middle of the ocean they were in the middle of the sea uh, it became very stormy and the people said listen this is because there is someone amongst us who is disobedient if we get rid of that person things will be okay so they had this you know routine that they went through where they had to draw lots Whoever it fell on, that is a person who they had to get rid of. So when they did it the first time, it landed on Yunus alayhi salam. Nobody could believe that it was him. So they did it a second and a third time. Every time it fell on Yunus alayhi salam. And so they said, that's it. We have to toss you. And they tossed him. It's a stormy night. In the depths of the ocean. And he gets swallowed up by a whale. So he's in three levels of darkness. The darkness of the night, the darkness of the ocean, and the darkness of, you know, the stomach of the whale. And at that time, he remembers. He remembers whom? He remembers the one he always remembered. And he says, La ilaha illa anta subhanak. Inni kuntu min al-zalimin. He remembers Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he says, There is none worthy of worship besides you. Subhanak. Praising and glorifying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Inni kuntu min al-zalimin. Indeed, I was from amongst the wrongdoers. It is said that upon hearing these words, the malaika started to cry. The angels were crying. And they said, Sawtun ma'roof, min abdin ma'roof, walakin la nadri aynahu. That this is a familiar voice from a familiar slave, but we do not know where he is. The angels were unaware of where Yunus alayhi salam was. But the point here is, Sawtun ma'roof, min abdin ma'roof. How do they recognize that voice? It is because as I mentioned just a short while ago, he was in the habit of always remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the angels got to know him. What does the hadith say? تَعَرَّفْ عَلَى اللَّهِ فِي الرَّخَاءِ يَعْرِفْكَ فِي الشِدَّةِ Be familiar with Allah during times of ease. And Allah will be familiar with you in times of difficulty. When things are going well, make sure that you don't forget Allah. Because people have that tendency. You don't have any need for wealth. Everything is available to you. You've got no problems in your life. This is when people are very likely to forget Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When things become tough, then people want to know Allah all of a sudden. Before that, they didn't really care. Look at how many people. When things are going well for them, you know, the job's going well, no problems at home, the kids are fine. You know, driving the best of, of cars, living in the best of homes, people get lazy. They're not keen to go to the masjid regularly. They may be negligent and, you know, maybe miss a few prayers here and there. 
not worry too much about giving charity, too busy, too involved in their lives. All of a sudden when things turn sour, then not only are they in the masjid, but they're the first ones in the masjid, in the first row. I'm not saying that is in and of itself a bad thing, but it's not that you should only do so when you're in difficulty. What about being first in the masjid when things are going well? لَإِن شَكَرْتُمْ لَأَزِيدَنَّكُمْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that if we are to be grateful to Him, subhanahu wa ta'ala, He will grant us increase. He will give you even more. So one of the best ways of preserving the good that we have is by constantly being grateful to Allah. And being grateful to Allah is not only a lip service, not something we simply say, but it is through our actions. We keep our duty to Allah, we do things for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to show that we are grateful. This is how we show our great gratitude to Allah azza wa jal. So Yunus alayhi salam was from amongst those grateful slaves, from amongst those who knew Allah in times of ease, so in times of difficulty, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not abandon him. And you know the story as well. When he, alayhi salam, said those words, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of course, knew where he was. The angels did not know, but Allah jalla wa ala knew. And he subhanahu wa ta'ala caused that whale to spit him up on the shore uh, until, the end, until the end of that. In any event, there are many, many incidents that I can relate to you. Al-Awza'i rahimahullah and so on and so forth. Uh, and, and, and these stories are, to be frank with you, uh, very beautiful and, 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 and very uh, inspiring. Some of them would, you know, had to come in front of tyrants. And, you know, they wouldn't know how they are going to react. But uh, because they were righteous, and because they remembered Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even during those trying times, then He subhanahu wa ta'ala came to their rescue, He came to their aid. So the Prophet alayhi salatu wa salam says, Ihfadillaha yahfadhk. Ihfadillaha tajidhu tujahak. These are words to live by. Be mindful of Allah. Keep your duty to Allah and you will find Him before you. Allah will protect you. And I gave you some examples of how Allah Azza wa Jal will protect us. He Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala will protect us in many, many different ways. As we said, يحفظ, It's like saying to somebody, Fear Allah. Ittaqillah. Similar to saying, to saying those words. And as we know, Allah Jalla wa Ala says, وَمَن يَتَّقِ اللَّهَ يَجْعَلْ لَهُ مَخْرَجًا وَيَرْزُقْهُ مِنْ حَيْثُ لَا يَحْتَسِبْ Whoever keeps their duty to Allah, whoever is mindful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, وَمَن يَتَّقِ اللَّهَ يَجْعَلْ لَهُ مَخْرَجًا Allah will find a way out for that person from every difficulty. And He will provide for them through means that they never imagined. وَمَن يَتَّقِ اللَّهَ فَهُوَ حَسْبُهُ be mindful of Allah. Fear Allah Azza wa as He should be feared. And He will be there for you and He is sufficient for you. This is an aqidah. This is the belief that we must have. At all times, yes, Allah is in control. This is why when He continues, إِحْفَظِ إِحْفَظِ So then the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam says, when you ask, ask of Allah. When you seek aid, assistance, then seek assistance from Allah. Now here somebody may ask, so am I not allowed to ask for help from anyone, for anything? The answer is that, listen, ultimately, we turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the aqidah I'm talking about. This is that firm belief that I'm speaking of. Under all circumstances, do not be as some of the people are. And you know what? I've seen it so many times. How often have I visited people in hospitals? And you know, subhanAllah, when, when a person's faith is not that strong, it's amazing what they may do. Sometimes it appears as though a person is, mashaAllah, strong in their faith. But it is during those trying times that you really find out who they are. Of course, I won't take any names, but I do recall an incident where uh, a family that I know was afflicted. 
the father became ill, perhaps he had a heart attack or whatever it was, and he was more or less on life support. And alhamdulillah, we used to go and visit on a regular basis, myself and, and, and some other brothers. And the family was, you know, fairly well known to us. And on that one occasion, we were shocked, absolutely shocked, to find in the room, next to the father, a man who was well known in our community for being like an extreme Sufi. So, you know, seeking aid from other than Allah, things of that nature. A ruqya, a shari'iyya, if somebody is ill, of course, it is prescribed for us to recite Qur'an over them. It is prescribed for us to recite certain, you know, dua over them. They are found in the sunnah of the Prophet wasallam. But these, you know, Sufis, they will do different things. Not according to the sunnah. They will make up certain duas that include other than the name of Allah Azza wa They will ask through, you know, their shaykh or whoever it may be. They will burn incense, and, you know, all sorts of weird things. And this was carrying on. And I was shocked. And when, you know, we questioned the family or the brother who perhaps uh, brought this person, they said, you know, but there's no, there's no, they, this doesn't seem to be any hope. Out of desperation we have done this. Ya yeah, subhanallah. And then they had to be reminded. Who is it then other than Allah? Who responds to those who are desperate and who are in need? And who removes evil? It is none other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the reminder here is وَإِذَا سَأَلْتَ فَاسْأَلِ اللَّهُ وَإِذَا اسْتَعَنْتَ فَاسْتَعِنْ بِاللَّهُ First and foremost, turn to Allah. At all times, our first reaction must be to turn to Allah Azza wa Jal and not to turn to the people. Not to turn to the, to the creation of Allah wa Ta'ala. You're in difficulty, turn to Allahumma Rizuqni. Oh Allah, grant me sustenance. Don't look for handouts. Turn to Allah. You're in debt, turn to Allah. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, to make those means available to you through which you can pay off your debt. When you need assistance in something, first and foremost, turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He, Azza wa Jal, will help us in ways that we, we can imagine and in ways that we, we don't imagine. It may be that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will assist us and we, we can't even see what was the means through which he assisted us? He would just do it for us. And at other times, he subhanahu wa ta'ala will send our way people who will assist us. So turn to Allah. When it is absolutely necessary and we have to ask others for assistance, as long as we don't believe that they are the ones who are assisting, ultimately, we realize that it is from Allah and they are simply a means. And Allah Jalla wa ala did not make it Haram. It's not forbidden for us to turn to others to help us if it is something that is within their means and their capability. Right? So if I know somebody can help me in something, Alhamdulillah, there's no harm in turning to them. Knowing that they are the sabab, they are the means. And Allah is the creator of the means as well. Musabib al-asbab. But as much as possible, try not to ask people for things. We're not talking about pride here. No, no, no. We're just talking about trying to be self-sufficient and being dependent always upon none other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So try to remember that lesson. إِذَا سَأَلْتَ فَاسْأَلِ اللَّهِ وَإِذَا اسْتَعَنْتَ فَاسْتَعِنْ بِاللَّهِ Allah, first and foremost. At the beginning of that difficulty, turn to Allah. Throughout that difficulty, always turn to Allah. Near the end of that difficulty and after the difficulty, continue to turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the huge lesson. Our hearts must be attached to none other than Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala. وَإِذَا اسْتَعَنْتَ فَاسْتَعِنْ بِاللَّهِ And the Prophet alayhi salatu wa salam also teaches Abdullah ibn Abbas رضي الله عنه وارضاه about this rule that he has. The sunnah. The way of Allah and His creation. He says to him, you need to be aware of this. And that is if the people were to all unite 
everybody, you know, is unanimous that they want to help you in something. That they want to bring some good to you. Because you see what happens is, sometimes if, when, when people help us, we become too attached to them. And we think that, wow, you know, this is wonderful. And, and, and we feel indebted to them for life. Again, I don't want people to misunderstand. If somebody helps us out in something, by all means, we must thank them. مَنْ لَمْ يَشْكُرِ النَّاسِ لَمْ يَشْكُرِ اللَّهِ The Prophet ﷺ says that whoever is not grateful to the people has not been grateful to Allah. Allah made them the means for you. By all means, thank them. You should thank them. But don't think that they are the source of that good. No, no. They were the means through which that good came to you. Allah is the one who sent them your way. So keep everything in perspective. Thank them. But never forget to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who sent them your way. And this is why we need this lesson. Remember that everybody, if they decided that they wanted some good to reach you, they would never be able to accomplish it. Not unless Allah azza wa jal had decreed it and He had willed it. Similarly, if they want to harm you, they're not going to be able to harm you. Not unless Allah had already decreed it. So ultimately everything comes from Allah and this is why that reminder and you know if you really ponder over this hadith really ponder over it then no matter what happens to you in your life never will an incident take place when you sit there feeling absolutely hopeless and you sit there you know thinking that th there's nothing that can be done for you you will never feel regret in your life would anybody like to learn how that's done? Can you imagine living a life free of regret and remorse? Oh, how I wish. Oh, how I wish. How often does that happen to us in our lives? The other narration states, وَعْلَمْ أَنَّمَا أَصَابَكَ لَمْ يَكُنْ لِيُخْطِئَكْ وَأَنَّمَا أَخْطَأَكَ لَمْ يَكُنْ لِيُصِيبَكْ Whatever came your way was never meant to pass you by. And whatever passed you by was never ever meant to reach you. Whether you want to look at it in terms of positive things that come your way or negative things. It's the same thing that applies. You, alhamdulillah, were blessed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You end up, you know, getting top marks in, in your class. You graduate with honors. And Allah azza wa jal makes it easy for you. And you're able to get a, a, a good paying job and mashallah you're enjoying a lot of worldly success. Let's assume that alhamdulillah you are also, you know, keeping up your, your duties at least with Allah Azza wa Jal. وَعْلَمْ أَنَّ مَا أَصَابَكْ لَمْ يَكُنْ يُخْطِئَكْ You should remember at that time that this came my way, alhamdulillah. I have to be grateful to Allah. But also know that it's not all you're doing. Because many of us unfortunately uh, become conceited when we start doing that well in life. We start thinking very highly of ourselves. And we will look down upon those who are not as fortunate as us. This is a huge danger. At takabbur, when we become arrogant, you know, and conceited, this is a huge, huge problem. This is when we start remembering. It came my way. This was the will of Allah. It's not my own doing. Even the fact that I studied hard and I was able to understand all of these things, if it wasn't for Allah, I would not have been able to understand any of these things. And those who did not attain what I attained, it was also the will of Allah. It is you know, not something that I should hold against them and insult them. No. ذَلِكَ فَضْلُ اللَّهِ يُؤْتِيهِ مَنْ يَشَاءَ that is from the favors of Allah and Allah bestows His favors upon whomever He wills from His creation. So always keep that in mind. And if something doesn't come your way, don't feel regret and remorse. Okay, Alhamdulillah, it wasn't meant for me. At the end of the day, it was not meant for me. That's it. End of story. And you look for something that is, you know, that is an alternative for you. It's okay. Don't sit there and, and cry about, you know, something that didn't come your way. Because we learn from the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ that if it wasn't meant for you, it wasn't meant for you.
It would never have reached you, no matter what you did. You may have, you know, tried as hard as you can. You bent over backwards, but still, you didn't attain the goal of yours. Alhamdulillahi ala kulli hal. We thank Allah and we praise Him under all circumstances. We don't blame Allah for anything. You know, when things do not turn out the way we want them to turn out, there could be several reasons. Don't think always that it is a punishment from Allah. That is a possibility. It is a possibility that when things don't turn out the way that we want them to turn out, it is a possibility that it is a punishment from Allah. It is because of our shortcomings, because of certain sins that we have committed, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends certain difficulties our way, certain calamities befall us. We are afflicted in certain ways. Yes, it is a possibility. But it is also a possibility that it is a test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, when something of that nature befalls us, the first thing that you and I should do is not feel sorry for ourselves, but we should check that slate of ours between us and Allah. Is there something that I've done that as a result of it, perhaps I've been deprived of this good? Point the finger at myself before I point the finger at anybody else. And I don't mean this only on an individual basis. What about us as an ummah? Like today, look at how we're being afflicted everywhere. Look at the state of humility that we are in. Disgrace of, that the ummah is living today. We can blame it on America. Oh, I guess we do, don't we? We can blame it on a lot of people, and we do. But we never start by blaming ourselves. And the reality is, we're not angels. We have not been keeping up our end of the bargain. Ihfadillah yahfadk. Have we been mindful of Allah? That we deserve His protection? I think all of us, if we look at this very honestly, we'll find that no. We have not done what we need to do in order to deserve the protection of Allah. These calamities that have befallen us, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, وَمَا أَصَابَكُمْ مِن مُصِيبَةٍ فَبِمَا كَسَبَتْ أَيْدِيكُمْ وَيَعْفُ عَنْ كَثِيرٍ Meaning, that whatever calamities have befallen you, it is because of what your own hands have earned. In other words, we brought it on ourselves. And this is after what? وَيَعْفُ عَنْ كَثِيرٍ This is after Allah has overlooked so much. So yes, in these times, this is when we have to do some, some stock taking. And I'm reminded again here, and again, I'm talking first to myself and then the rest of you. You see, we make little of sins today. Anas ibn Malik, radiallahu anhu arda. In his time, he says, and amongst them were the Certainly the Tabi'een and perhaps some of the Sahaba. Says to him, he, he says to them, Innakum, he's talking to them about their attitude towards sins. Huh? He says to them, today, you consider things that you do, that is sins that you commit, you consider them to be insignificant, like a strand of hair. Strand of hair. What is one strand of hair? out of a whole head of hair, for example. You consider them to be insignificant. But we, during the time of the Prophet وسلم, would have looked at those very things that you look at today as being nothing, we considered them to be from the destructive sins. What do we do with our eyes? See, because we've become desensitized. Things that we watch on TV. I'm, I'm not going to go and talk about some other more major sins. And doing it once or twice is one thing. And then you repent from it. But these are things that we do continuously and consistently for the sake of entertainment, things that we watch on television. 
men and women who are scantily clad, we sit and we laugh and consider it to be entertaining. Nothing wrong with it. Think about it. Leave alone the Prophet alayhi salatu wassalam. One of the Sahaba, do you think if they were sitting next to you, you would dare to watch? But Allah is watching us. So, I'm giving you one example and then we try to apply it to the rest of our lives. What we do with our ears, what we do with our tongues. Ihfadillaha yahfadk. We want the protection of Allah, then we have to be mindful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Look, be mindful of Allah. So be mindful of things such as our prayers, as salah. One of the biggest problems in the ummah today is the fact that we have abandoned the salah. Illa man rahima rabbi. And when I say abandoned the salah, I mean abandoned offering our prayers at their appointed times and in jama'ah, particularly for the men, in the masajid. A huge problem in the ummah today. We have masajid which are crying. They're empty. They get full on the day of Jumu'ah. They get filled when you know a, a famous person dies or you know a person in the family or a prominent family dies they're full during some days in Ramadan and the rest of the year they're empty think about how many Muslims there are in this country for example and the number of masajid in the areas or the you know surah whatever it may be Really, even those, if every one of us who is supposed to be praying in jama'ah attended, do you think those masajid would be sufficient for us? But right now they're empty. How come? Ihfadillaha yahfadk. From the most important of things is this salah. Praying five times a day. When I say abandon, two times a day doesn't really cut it. And I've talked about this many times and will continue because it is... The biggest of reminders to me then, then the rest of you. The first thing that you and I will be asked about on the day of Qiyamah. Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu arda was standing in prayer when he was assassinated and from the last of the words that he uttered were reminders of the Salah. That there is no place in Islam for those who don't establish the prayer. What place do, do they have in Islam? You want Allah's protection? Let's start with the basics. What about those prayers? There are other things that Allah Azza wa Jal and His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam have ordered us or encouraged us to be mindful of. Okay, the Salah is one of those things of course which is clear cut. Absolutely we must. Then there are other things that maybe we don't realize if we were to be mindful of them then we, we would get rewards that are unimaginable. The wudu. The Prophet ﷺ told us, even with the wudu, that is, try to remain constantly in the state of wudu. Go to work while you're in, in wudu. Not only you know, two minutes before, before the salah is going to begin, we go do our wudu, but remaining in wudu as much as we can. The Prophet ﷺ told us that only the true believer is, is that person who will, you know, uh, maintain the wudu throughout the day and you know, there's a, a beautiful hadith in which uh, the Prophet وسلم, was addressing the Sahaba he said من قال رضيت بالله ربا وبالإسلام دينا وبمحمد صلى الله عليه وسلم نبيا كان على, على الله حق أن يرضيه so basically the meaning of this is the Prophet والسلام, says to this gathering of companions that whoever says Raditu Billahi Rabba and pleased with Allah as my Lord, with Islam as my religion, and with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi as my Prophet, then it is their right over Allah that that He will cause them to be pleased as well. So Allah will cause that person to be pleased. And this Sahabi says, wow, those are amazing words. And Umar ibn al-Khattab says, oh, you haven't been with us the whole time? Listen, what was before that was even more beautiful. So he says, okay, so what was before that? And he says to him that the Prophet says, man tawadda 
فأحسن الوضوء. So whoever does the wudu and perfects it. These seem to be such small things, right? Because again, we all do wudu, but very often we just rush through it. We're not even, you know, that conscious of making sure that we wash every limb as it should be washed and so forth. فأحسن الوضوء and perfects that wudu. Then says, أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وأشهد أن محمد رسول الله. ها؟ اللهم اجعلني من التوابين واجعلني من المتطهرين. The dua. So saying the shahada and then saying Allahumma jalni min al-tawabin Oh Allah, place me amongst those who repent to you often Waj'alni min al-mutafahirin And place me amongst those who purifies themselves Futihat lahu abwabu al-jannati al-thamaniya That the eight gates of paradise will be kept open for that person And he will be asked to enter from any of the gates that he or she wishes Hafidhu so there are so many of these duties that we have towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I think I may have mentioned this phrase before the problem with us today is that many of these ibadat many of these uh, acts of worship have become empty rituals quite meaningless we go through the motions but we don't ponder over what we are doing I'm going to go back to this issue of the wudu how many of us realizes what we are doing when we are doing the wudu. How many of us realizes that sins are being washed away? Literally, sins are being washed away from our bodies when we are taking wudu. How many of us realizes that we take wudu so that we will be in a state where we are prepared for salah at any time? This is why Zainul Abidin, uh, rahimahullah, he, one of the great grandchildren of Ali radiallahu anhu arda, was well known for his piety. And when he would do wudu before going to, to pray, his complexion would change. And they would ask him, what's the matter? Every time you're doing wudu, you know, you turn, you, you turn different colors. How come? And he said, because as I do wudu, I come to realize before whom I'm going to stand. You're going to stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Does that not move us? See? So it, it, all of these acts of worship that we do, they need to be done with some, with some meaning. So the hadith, please, let us all try first to learn that hadith and along with that, let us try to live by that hadith. The hadith again, Be mindful of Allah and Allah will protect you. So your life and my life will revolve around Allah Azza wa Jal. Be mindful of Allah and He will always be there in front of you. He will be there before you. When you need Him, He will be there for you. This is a promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Huh? Be well acquainted with Allah during times of ease. And Allah will not forget you and will not abandon you during times of difficulty. When you ask, ask of Allah. When you seek assistance, seek the assistance of Allah. And if everybody tried to bring some good to you, or tried to bring some harm to you, Huh? They would never accomplish that goal of theirs unless Allah had already decreed it. Unless He decreed that the good would reach you or that that harm would befall you. Rufi'atil aqram wa jaffatil suhuf. So the pens have been lifted and the pages have dried. In other words, Allah Azza wa willed it a long time ago. It was recorded and that's it. There is no changing what Allah had willed. Therefore, you will never feel regret in your life if you live according to this hadith. I beg of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us of those who are mindful of Him, of him subhanahu wa ta'ala. Those who keep their duty to Him so that we then deserve the protection and the help and the assistance of Allah wa ta'ala. I beg of Him to place us amongst those whose hearts are always attached to Him. Jalla sha'nuh. Aqulu qawli hadha. Wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum wa li sa'ili muslimina fa astaghfiruh. Innahu huwa al-ghafurur rahim.